Today, I'm proud to welcome Carolyn and Jeanette, who are going to share their strategies for developing self-confidence and strong public speaking skills. Carolyn Auchin is a career development practitioner at USQ and will be co-presenting this webinar with Jeanette Hayden from Toastmasters. All right, over to you both. Thank you, everybody. It's lovely to see you guys here today. And we're looking forward to having a, a gossip about the joys of public speaking, because for me, it is a joy. And I have with me today the lovely Jeanette from Toastmasters. Now, Jeanette, you are also a, um, a marriage celebrant, I believe. That's correct. Yes. Awesome. So you do quite a bit of public speaking. I never used to, but I do now. <laughs> And, and that's what we're talking about today, that you don't have to be a natural at this kind of stuff. The reality is it can be a learned skill and it's how you approach it. That's right. Yeah. So as we go through, um, please do feel free to ask questions and Emma will, of course, bring them up at the end and, and we'll get started. So um, why were you scared of public speaking? Why wasn't I scared of public why speaking? Why were you scared of public no, speaking? No, why wasn't I? Everything to do with it, <laughs> I was scared of. <laughs> so basically, uh, studies show that um, people are actually more fearful of death, spiders and heights, um, but their greatest fear is actually public speaking. So when we consider that that's their greatest fear, um, I get a bit worried. So I feel like fear is something that's in your mind, it's not real, okay? So it, it feels real and it causes real emotions oh, and exactly. real activity, yes. but um, danger is real. Fear is just the emotion that you believe danger is coming. Yes, what you're feeling is definitely real, mm -hmm. but it's caused, the only person who can really see it is you mm. and feel it is you. People around tend to think, no, nah, you're very calm and you did that really well and you're so confident and then inside you're going, no, I wasn't. <laughs> Not at all. If you could feel and see what I wasn't like on the inside, you'd have a totally different perspective on it. And this is where, you know, for me, it's about considering logic and critical thinking skills around uh, around those fears. So, for example, if you die, it's definitely worse than public speaking because you, you're not there anymore. Yes? Yes. And if you're at a height and looking down, um, you, you know, as long as you're standing on solid ground, equally public speaking, standing on solid ground, it can work for you. Spiders, I'm sorry, I'm not logical about spiders. I don't like them either. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> so in regards to strategies for public speaking, the wonderful thing is there's a lot we can do, isn't there, Gina? There is. Just to remember, though, that it's a not a one fit for all. So certain things help some people and there's other strategies to help different people. It's finding out what works for you. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I, the, one of the wonderful parts about Jeanette and I working together on this is I love public speaking. It gives me a proper buzz um, and that's fantastic for me. But similar fact is, is Jeanette is a good public speaker, but um, she's had to develop that skill. So between the two of us, hopefully we'll cover a nice range of strategies. So as we go through, first up, tell us about Toastmasters. How does Toastmasters work? Toastmasters is part of Toastmasters International, which, which is an organisation that helps people work on their public speaking skills. Mm -hmm. We hold meetings regularly and give encouragement to help you to take little baby steps at your own pace, your self pace, so mm -hmm. just to learn strategies and to help you to get to where you want to be with your public speaking journey. I yeah. like to call it a journey. Absolutely. I, you know, I love a journey. He doesn't love travel. Um, when we're thinking about this kind of stuff, you said to me when we spoke the other week that there were some members in Toastmasters that have been members for 30 years. Yes. In especially, I'm a member of two clubs. Springfield Lakes is one of those. And one of our members has been a member of Toastmasters for 30 years. Our club has only been around for 11, I think, 12 this year. So we're relatively new compared to some of the others but the experience in, within the clubs is, is wonderful to have that as backup for new people when they come in last meeting we had i think visitors come along about six visitors come along to find out just what we we're all about so although we've got experience we're also people throughout the whole of the levels of from beginners right the way through to experience and that's where we get we work we help each other 
Wonderful. So when you when you say that you help each other and everything else like that, um, what's the diversity of people that need to use Toastmasters or want to use Toastmasters? Is it is it all teachers or all um, all um, people that work in retail or all lawyers or is it a big huge mix? It's a huge mix. We have a lot of people who are in the defence forces. Mm -hmm. We have people in management who are looking at having to give speeches or run staff meetings and need to know timing and things like that. And we have students Absolutely. who just have never done it before, who are looking at going for interviews. Where do I start? How can I get into an interview? What do I say? Fantastic. A lot of them prompt you speaking, which is what interviews is. Absolutely. So when we think about that, when we think about, you know, the diversity of people that are going somewhere to get support in public speaking, you, you know, it normalises the reality that people find public speaking challenging. I love public speaking, but I still find it very challenging. It, it's, it's, a, it's a multitask, it, it's stressful, it's full on, it's all of those things. So as we go through the presentation today, please realise you're not the only one. And the coolest part is there's a lot of support service like, services like Toastmasters, like this very wonderful USQ Beyond the Books webinar, um, to help you strategise towards solutions. So up on screen here, you'll notice these are the Toastmasters clubs in Ipswich. So you can have a little squizzle and see there's a really Really, really quite a large range of opportunities that you can utilise and Brisbane would have the same. Brisbane has got so many more as well. Yeah, and then, you, you know, if you are interstate or overseas, you know, Toastmasters is international and I would highly recommend their website. There's some lovely free resources on there that you can access uh, without without any support whatsoever, which yes. is nice. Yes, without, even, without being a member, you can go on to the, the Toastmasters International website and just scroll down and you've got links and such great information on there that once you're a member, of course, you get even more through clubs and things like that for support. Wonderful. So as we go through today, realise that, you know, it is an opportunity for you to utilise Toastmasters or an equivalent service. There's a lot of support networks out there for people needing to learn how to public speak. Now, for me, step one is planning in regards to public speaking. Yes. Uh, I um, I know that when we spoke the other day, we talked about the two kinds of public speaking. So you've got that um, public speaking with the big, huge plan, like the written out speech, mm -hmm. and then you've got the improvisation. Is that right? That's right, yes. Okay. Now, what do you like better? I actually sometimes better at impromptu. Fantastic. I don't have to think about what I'm saying. I just get up and I say whatever comes out. <laughs> and then I go and sit down and think, well... I said it, I can't take it back. So again, we move back to that. The greatest fear is in anticipation. So impromptu speaking means that you haven't had time to cook on it and overthink it and worry about what everybody's going to say or think, etc., etc. So, But planning is a great strategy to minimise that fear level. So considering that it's relevant. So when we talk about relevance, it's about meeting your demographic. So meeting the needs of the people that you're speaking to. Yeah. So... Um, when you're talking about meeting the needs of the people you're speaking to, consider things like their age, their interests, um, their sensibilities. So in some environments, it would be appropriate to use quite formal language and in other environments, it would be appropriate to, to be very relaxed and, and social, chatty and social. social. Yeah, absolutely. So when you're thinking about um, making sure that it's relevant, also making sure that it's going to um, add value to their current knowledge. You don't want to be saying things that they already know. And you want to keep the interest as well. Mm. So if you start rambling off on different tangents, your audience is not going to listen. And what you need is to get your message across in the shortest, concise time because they're taking the time out to listen, mm. so and their time is important as well. Now, when Jeanette said shortest concise time, that does not mean that you talk as fast as physically possible in order to get it over faster, because they may not be able to understand you if you talk that quickly. And that's where we go on to um, our next point. Researched um, your when you're talking and speaking to people, you need to have a strong backup to what you're saying. So, um, for example, I, I I did a few wedding speeches a few years ago. Um, I, you know, we all have friends that get married all in the same year, um, so I had to make each speech different because we're the same group of friends. Yes. And um, I'm I'm not as creative as as I might like to be. <laughs> 
So I went online and I looked at lots of other people's speeches and I read through their jokes and I read through what they talked about and I and I started to pull together a speech that would work for me because I'm more of an impromptu speaker. I will never read off a speech. I have dot points. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I write out my whole speech yes. and then I highlight the important bits and then I dot point those bits. And I think that's important to remember because it's different for everybody once a day. Some speeches that I have done at Toastmasters, I have read from start to finish mm. on a left and to the side so that I can still have the open body language and the other things. That What's open body language? Open body language is where people can read, they look at you, they see your face. If you've got your arms crossed, it's not very receptive, open them up, extend your arms, you're welcoming them into your space. Mm -hmm. So by able to do that, whether you're reading, have the legs into the side mm -hmm. works well. Other speeches I've used dot points because I've been more familiar with the content. So I think, yeah, okay, I know that. When I do weddings, I read for the majority. Celebrant, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and try to, but try to leave it open as well mm. for, for the bride and groom basically for the couple to have their special moments so each time I speak I work out what is best mm. what suits me best and that's where again you've researched a demographic you've researched what's required by the occasion the situation um, or, or for that matter the learning for educators or future teachers because lots of teachers are worried about this kind of stuff too and you're also respectful and that's understanding the demographic and, and, and being respectful not to not, to not read off the slides because the simple fact is that people if you're using a PowerPoint presentation or a Prezi presentation if you're reading off the slides you're assuming they can't read and that's just rude. So you want to you want to add value to those PowerPoint right. slides through your discussion rather than just kind of using them for your speech. Yes. So when you're thinking about planning, it's probably the the uh, the best way to start. Yes. Yes. Know know what you're talking about. Get as much information as you can so that you're armed with everything. So if you lose your page when you have got your notes, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know it well enough. To be able to continue and I'm assuming that it's at this point that I say don't worry guys I know that your anxiety levels all went up when you heard about losing your speech it's okay it's okay because you know um, it, it, the reality is you wrote it you can do it but the simple fact is don't lose it it's the easiest way I'm a big fan of um, I have a flash drive attached to my set of keys that I use every day and that is, that is my centre. If I lose that, I will cry, I promise. But, yeah. you know, simple fact is that's where my speeches live so that I don't have to worry about random pieces of paper, okay? Yeah, I'm a paper person. I like to hold it and feel it and touch it and fold it and put it on the, on the lectern. So, but if it falls off of there, it's like, <gasps> oh, no, it's okay. I was up to here. I either pick it up and put it back on and I can continue or I can do without. Critical thinking. I'm loving the fact that she's thinking out loud. And the other thing about planning is also doing it in advance so that you have time to practice because practice is the other thing. We all need to be adaptable and flexible in the moment of presentation. But the reality is, is that um, in, in this situation, planning is the key. The more planful you are, the better that you know your speech, the better you'll be able to deal with the fact that you just dropped it on the floor. That's right. So as we go through, big tip, avoid boredom, okay? Now, um, what, are the biggest, what are the biggest micro expressions or things that you notice that demonstrate boredom in an audience? The body language. Phones, people getting on their phones. You look around and think, okay, heads down. They're not watching. They haven't got the eye contact. I need to switch something that's going to bring them back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's where, um, you know, for me, I, I live on the engagement of my audience. So if I see somebody yawning or people like wiggling in their chairs or I see people very, very slumped on their phones, talking to their friends, if you can hear chatter in the audience, um, my best tip in chatter in the audience is to just shut up for a moment. Seriously, if you stop talking, and then they stop talking because they don't want to be seen to be talking, you can then say, thanks for that, and then keep going, okay? It's not about getting overly stressed about people talking in the audience. They may have even been on topic, 
okay but the reality is is that you need to um keep their attention and that's again through planning and through not saying um all the time and also through eye contact i'm a big fan of eye contact yeah i'm a big fan of noise fantastic let's go yeah so when i'm doing a speech if there's a gesture that i can do that will bring them back and it might be as much as banging a desk mm -hmm. or clapping my hands or something like that it's what 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 did i miss mm, absolutely so people suddenly yeah. look up um i am a big fan of um now these aren't the gestures you were talking about are they no. no, you don't want these gestures in a speech, do you? No. <laughs> so when I'm in a, um, in a public speaking situation, particularly those speaking situations where you can move around to the audience, I'm a big fan of standing near the people that are talking. So I work a lot with um, young people um, and working with youth it is a, an area where there sometimes are talkers. It's not about me worrying about the fact that they're talking. I just go stand near them and they nearly always stop. I love eyeballing. Oh, she's got the eyes. This is good. I'm loving this. Now, rocking and pacing. This is something that I see people do. Why do they do it? Nerves. Okay, fair enough. Yep. Often they're nervous. They don't know what to do with their hands or where to stand or because they're thinking so much about their speech and what they're talking about. They don't even realise that they're doing it. But what I do try to do is tap on my legs if I don't... Crossing your hands, once I said, doesn't give you that open body language once again. Mm. So hands by your side, relaxed. Guys, don't ever put them in your pocket. <laughs> We're all tend to do that, even the Toastmasters. We pick people up on that. I put my fingertips on my legs and I tap. So no one else really can see it, but that steadies me back to being normal, relaxed and focusing what I'm doing. Okay. So... I absolutely support anything that's like kind of on the down low kind of thing. You know, the other thing is having calm breathing before you actually start your presentation or your speech. So taking a moment before your speech to just re, you know, remember to breathe because a lot of people in speaking don't remember to breathe. And if you can't breathe, you can't speak. It's kind of a physiological reality. That's now, the other thing that I would do, and I have got an example here, is I use a paper clip in a situation where I'm feeling nervous because I have a tendency to fidget with my hair quite frequently when I'm nervous um, and or pick my nails, which is gross, and I apologise for letting you all know that. Uh, but simple fact is by playing with a paper clip, it's very small, you can't even see it, and the simple fact is it keeps my hands busy in an interview situation or something like that. In public speaking, I'm a big fan of, you know, hand gestures and moving around. But when it comes to an interview or a time where you're, you're needing to um, keep your hands still or, or calmer, um, that's the way that I would do it. And from a breathing point of view, what I would suggest is you take a deep breath in, hold it for four, and then breathe it out for four and do that three or four times. Now, I'm not suggesting that in a public forum you go, <gasps> okay, again, nice and quiet, deep breath in, hold for four, out for four. And it's calming. It, it, it slows your heart rate down, okay? It will minimise um, blood rushing to the face or the neck or anything else like that. Now, I know that I don't judge people harshly for blushing, in public speaking how about you i suffer from it fair enough now big thing for me probably now probably red i don't know if the years close to see it but I, I know it's there to a slight degree at least but definitely something i suffer from now interestingly enough that's a physiological response to stress but it's not a bad thing because what it means is is that you're getting blood to your brain Blood to your brain means that uh, you are able to think faster and able to act on those thoughts faster. So as much as it makes you feel like you're not going to be as good at it, it is actually helping you. It is. Yeah. <laughs> but. <laughs> the one downfall is because you've got the blood to your brain and your brain's going into overtime, blah, 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 you need to control your speed of speaking mm. and not just come out and ramble, 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 ramble. So one word that we use in Toastmasters all the time is pause. You, have, you stop, you take your breath, it lets your 
brain slow down or your mouth catch up, whichever it needs to do to bring it back into sync so that you know where you're going. Fantastic. And pause, we always say. And you stop and pause, people will think, what are they going to say next? Or what did they just say that was so important? Mm. Uh, silence is deadly and very, very useful. Yes. Yeah. And taking those moments of silence can all, also cause you to think. So when we think about that, again, it's about understanding the needs of your industry. So you might be studying something and um, you find out, oh, gosh, I've got to do a talk. Rather than just worrying about it or avoiding it, uh, using some action and actually doing something about it, accessing things like this very webinar, so congratulations to our lovely participants, but also um, actioning it through joining a group or as Jeanette said, working with your team or the people around you to help you um, practice. I, I have practiced in front of family. I've practiced in front of friends. I um, have practiced in front of the mirror because that's the place that I find out whether I make the weird face or not. Yeah? That's right. So when you're thinking about this kind of stuff, you need to, you need to practice, you need to be mindful during the presentation because there's nothing worse than somebody that goes a million miles under time or a million miles over time. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Definitely. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has ever attended a conference or, or for that matter, a school presentation, <laughs> <laughs> they always go over. Um, sticking to time is an important part of engagement. People have an expectation of how long something's going to take. Try to do it within that period of time. If you happen to speed through and finish early, the world's not going to end. But the reality is if you stretch it too far, people will, will disengage and you actually put other people who may be up speaking next off their game. So you're really best off sticking to your time. Now, the way that I do that is I actually, whenever I'm public speaking, I set my um, phone for the length of time that I'm going to be speaking for and it goes off as a, as, as a vibrate alarm to remind me um, when I'm out of time so that I can finish up within the next sort of 30, 45 seconds. And I usually ask somebody in the audience to give me the two-minute call. In Toastmasters, we actually use a light system. Oh, okay. So everything in our meeting from when we start to when we finish is timed. Mm -hmm. For this exact reason, if you are at work and you're giving a three to five minute speech, you'll have an idea from some of our sessions in, to in Toastmasters how long that is mm. as well. So we have, and we work on the same traffic lights, green light, orange light, and red light. Mm. So... By doing that often in the meetings, you get a little bit of an idea yourself of how long a particular time frame is. Mm, absolutely. And when you're thinking about time frames, um, it's key to leave time for questions at the end if you're in a presenting situation for work. Equally, you don't have to leave time for questions if you are um, the, the bridesmaid who's giving a speech at the wedding. And you certainly don't need to leave time for questions if you're in a funeral. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're thinking about other areas where you might be speaking, it might just be you sitting with a group of other uni students in teamwork and you have trouble sharing your view. My biggest tip in that situation is that if you don't share your view, that's on you. And you don't want to feel frustrated for the whole length of a team assignment because you didn't share your great idea and get feedback for it. That was something that I used to really struggle with is we were at a group, several different places, not any one in particular, and they'd say, does anyone else have anything to add? And I'd sit there thinking, I so want to say this, I so want to say this, but I didn't have the confidence to actually say it. Mm. And then afterwards I thought, oh, I so should have asked that. But I didn't. So looking back now, if there's one thing I think that I could have changed, mm. it would have been to try to ask one question, just one, and then see if everyone else doesn't fall down and shake <laughs> <shot. laughs> So make that first little step in your own journey because it's your journey. So just one little step, one little question, and then expand from that. 
I, I like that tip. Um, and I'm a very confident person. I network regularly. I talk to lots of people. But I'm exactly the same. If I'm if I'm um, listening to a brilliant presentation and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is wonderful, I still don't want to be the first one to talk. Um, because then people go, oh, my God, she never shuts up. But, you know, from that kind of a perspective, asking that question is the best way to uh, clarify knowledge in your head. It's better to ask than just leave it, okay? And when you're thinking about asking that question, um, think about a situation and it's think about your elevator pitch. So when I talk about elevator pitch, it's a scenario where you walk into a lift and suddenly somebody that you really look up to and would love to speak to is there. And you have 30 seconds of that lift going up or going down in which to share enough information so that they go, oh, here's my business card, give me a call. I love yeah, that's a good analogy. So when you think about an elevator pitch, it's it's your um, pitch about you. So for example, if I were doing an elevator pitch, I might say, hi, I'm Carolyn. I'm a career development practitioner with six years experience within higher education, 10 years experience in international recruitment, and I'm also an early childhood teacher. So by saying that I'm able to get some information out, and then I can say, it's so lovely to meet you. I would really value the opportunity to buy you a coffee. Is there any chance that um, I could grab your card? I like that. And yes. by doing that, you know, when we think about public speaking, we're always thinking about big groups. Sometimes it's one person that's scary. That's right. I think another way to look at that as well, same situation if you're in an elevator and it's somebody who you had read their book, for example, mm -hmm. You could say, oh, so pleased to meet you. I've read your book. Do you have any more? I'd love to hear about it. And then... Absolutely. That. And that's that connectivity again. So building that relationship through shared experience. So I really enjoyed your speech. I'd love to catch up to talk more. This is who I am and being able to go from there. Now, if we return to the eye contact issue, now, I'm not suggesting you give stalker weirdo eye contact, okay? This is not about staring at one person. <laughs> um, uh, advice that used to be given around public speaking might have been imagine them naked. But personally, that would raise my anxiety levels <laughs> rather than drop it. Or imagine that they're all lettuce heads, which, again, I actually disagree with because they're people and you're meant to be meeting their engagement needs and, and their levels. Now, Jeanette had a nice tip, though, that you know can minimise anxiety. How do you do the whole eye contact without eye contact? If I'm in a group and I'm really not sure of what of my confidence level, because I'm the only one who can see it, I don't look at people, I look just above their heads. So I pin point three points around the room here, here and here. So it looks like I'm looking at people, mm. but I'm actually looking above them. So I'm not making eye contact to get that what am I doing and my anxiety goes up and all sorts of body just does all funny things by doing that I'm still focusing I'm giving the whole room my attention but I'm not actually looking at anybody and notice how Jeanette's still keeping her tone even and relaxed and popping pauses in notice that she's not monotoning or saying everything in the same inflection okay it's very very important to raise and also to drop your inflection through your talk if you talk at the same level in the same way through your whole speech people almost get lulled into a sense of sleepiness and um, Mr. Monotone Man or Mrs. Monotone Mrs. Uh, it, it is a very problematic speaker because what they are saying could be very useful, but it's almost said in a meditative um, trance like creating in the audience. So you need to make sure that you, you um, use your enthusiasm and that you change your facial expressions when you're speaking and um, feel free to, to, to use your, your, your gestures and things like that. Yes, gestures, pace and voice variance, mm. things that we focus on 
a lot in Toastmasters. And, and that voice variance doesn't have to be very, in, in Australia, everything's a question. We always finish on the up. We're always asking, you know, and, and it's quite hilarious because if you're coming from another country, you assume that an inflection at the end of a sentence is, is a question. So simple fact is, if you can use your inflection and use your pauses to define important moments in your talk, um, that combined with some eye contact for the people that are engaging with you with a little smile now and then, um, also eye contact with the people that aren't necessarily engaging to bring them back, it is a really integral part of, of, of good speech and good public speaking. So when we think about the worst thing that can happen, I always have to pop to the loo before I do any kind of public presentation. And that, you know, I'm not even that nervous anymore, but I, I must be because I've always got to pop to the loo. Uh, our bodies tell us <laughs> in more ways than one. Popping to the loo, going to the toilet, very normal. Mm -hmm. For me, red in the face, very normal. I'm used to it. So sometimes I cover it with makeup, sometimes I don't. <laughs> I get I cannot focus on what people before I go on to deliver my my speech. I'll have other people talking to me, but I can't actually hear or comprehend necessarily what they're saying because I'm trying to focus on me. Mm, absolutely. No, I, you know, I think that for me it is uh, a scenario where before a speech. If somebody is asking me to think critically about something, they've got a snowball's chance in a very hot place. Because when, before I'm going to be doing a talk, um, I need to focus on my mission work. So little, you know, boring tasks that need to get done. Because most of my brain is working on how's it going to go, what am I going to say, how's it going to sound, and making sure that I get a bit of quiet time before a public um, speaking or, or anything like that is important. Equally, in order to avoid nerves, sometimes it's great to have people around you who are distracting you from the fact that you're just about to public speak. Yes. I, I think... Another thing that people often say to me is, oh, I just feel sick. I mm -hmm. feel like I'm just going to throw up. Mm. I just say to them, have you ever thrown up? Mm. Well, no. I said, is that the worst that could happen? Mm. Is that you did throw up? We all saw that on, what was that movie? Um, oh, gosh, I've forgotten the name of the movie. <sighs> but, yes, there was a big vomit on stage, yes? yes? And simple fact, um, you know, that physical feeling of sickness is, again, your adrenaline pumping and it causes your body to have that reaction. But it doesn't mean that you are going to vomit. It just makes you feel a bit nauseous, usually. That's right. Unless it's extreme. You might have food poisoning. It might not even be the talking. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. So um, when you're thinking about uh, Pitch Perfect, sorry, I just had to go back ah, to the movie. Yes. In Pitch Perfect, it would be. So when we're thinking about what's the worst that can happen, if people aren't engaged, um, that's the worst thing that can happen, okay? You want people to be engaged in your talk. But if they're not engaged, that may not be about you. That might be about their scenario or their situation. And if they're not engaged, it's not the fact that that bad thing happened, it's what you learnt from it from next time, okay, for next time. So it might be, okay, I need to plan more in this area or they've heard that before or, okay, they're very difficult to engage, maybe a smaller group would work. Now, um, when you're thinking about uh, what's the worst thing that can happen, you could fall off the stage. Um, I recently had to go up on stage for a, a speaking opportunity and I was nervous enough that I didn't wear high heels that day because I was, I'm, I'm a klutz at best, um, I, I wore flat shoes to make sure that I minimised the chance of that. Yeah, so... Well, I can actually say when I was younger, I was asked to per participate in the performance mm -hmm. and there were probably 200 of us in this group. So I was a nobody. I was in the second last row, so short you couldn't even see me, but I physically could not walk out onto that stage. Mm. Now, I wasn't the only one. There was at least eight or ten of us and the people were going around saying, right, out to go, out to go. And they looked at me and went, just stay there, love, you'll be right. Mm. Because they looked at me and that was enough for them to say, can't do it. Mm. Now, on the weekend, I got called up to do a dance camp mm. and I've got two left feet. <laughs> 
so I cannot dance at all. But I went up on stage and made a fool of myself in the dance camp. The thing about this kind of stuff is, is that you need to challenge yourself in these spaces because your comfort zone has a lovely big couch in it. Couches don't move forward, okay? But the reality is, is in public speaking, just as in any kind of scenario, yes, there's some risk. But when you think about the reward, whether it be the assignment or, you know, being able to share your point of view or business, building on your self-confidence to know that you can do it if it's necessary. Those kind of things are what you're going after in these scenarios. So tips like tapping or tips like breathing beforehand, being very planful and, and thinking about what you're going to say, practicing in front of the mirror. Um, you know, I don't wear makeup very often and um, any of my workmates will attest to the fact that it's only when I've got a webinar or a big speak on or anything else like that that I put makeup on. Now, for me, it makes me feel slightly more confident, okay? But um, it, it's about challenging yourself to do these things so that you can improve. And the reality is if it screws up, the world's not going to end. You just stand up and you keep going. I once stood in a room of 300 people and fell over on a cord because I wander about in presentation. Now I stood up and I kept going. And and um, I'm a good speaker, so no one no one commented on it. They laughed, and for that matter, so did I. Uh, the reality is that stuff does happen in those situations, but it doesn't have to be a problem. It's how you deal with it that makes the difference and how you cope with it. The biggest thing is adding value to the people that you're speaking to, yeah? So if you've got a really great thing to add to their lives, uh, information-wise, or whether or not you want to add value to your mark because it's a group presentation, or whether you want to add value because you're a celebrant and you get paid to do so, yes? yes? definitely. <laughs> I'm getting paid, I have to do my best, and I'm on display. Mm -hmm. So I need to be confident in what I'm doing, have read through, practice, 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 so that I know it, even though I read most of it for the legal parts, mm -hmm. I know it well enough that, and I know my couple well enough mm -hmm. to know that if I lose, lose my place, it's no big deal, I can keep going. It's got to be valuable. And that's the other thing. When we talk about planning and public speaking, it is about having it in a logical sequence introducing, saying what's going to happen and when, talking about the what and when, and then summarising and finishing up quite strongly. Now, we've been in a public speaking scenario in this situation, have we not? That's so my lovely rainbow final slide, because I am an ally supporter, is around um, touching on the points that we've discussed today. So when you're thinking about that plan, okay, approach it similarly to how you would approach an assignment or, or a, um, a paper that you need to do. It needs to have an introduction. It needs to have a centre that um, has uh, demonstrable stories that discuss why that's the case or how that's the case. And then you, you need a summary at the end to pull it all together so everybody can see the point. We need to avoid boredom, and that's where we talked about inflection, topic. What else did we say about avoiding boredom? All sorts of things, just keeping your audience engaged absolutely and you know doing that through things like uh, sticking to your time to not go past it not rocking or pacing because then people only see the rocking and pacing they don't hear the words when you're doing that um, and also considering for your own needs with rocking and pacing and, and those nervous twitches, um, you've got the tapping suggestion of mm -hmm. Jeanette's, you've got my suggestion of possibly holding onto a paper clip or something nice and little that you can play with, um, and making sure that you use enough eye contact that you can keep people engaged and use body language that's open with gestures, stuff like this. Yeah? Finally, keeping it in perspective. It's not deaf. It's not falling over a cliff, okay? Spiders are much scarier in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, but keeping it in perspective, this is a necessary task that needs to be done in order to move to the next step. 
whether that be being the father of the bride, whether that be um, talking about uh, your requirements for an assessment piece, or whether that just be um, sharing your opinion in a group. Um, I work with quite a few people that have issues talking to their parents about particular issues. They get very, very nervous. Sometimes that's just one person or two people. That's right. I actually like to call it the leap of faith <laughs> because you used to think of fear, mm -hmm. but now you put in your faith in the fact that you can actually make a small step towards improving where you're at. Absolutely. And I think that that faith is in yourself in your skills, in your abilities, and in your motivation to make that change and to do that. And the best way to try it out is to give it a crack, okay? Um, worrying about it doesn't get you anywhere, okay? Doing something about it does. Make sure that you're um, keeping it in perspective and, and adding value to your audience. So when I say adding value to the audience, as we said before, it's about considering your content, uh, your topic, and the way that you talk about it, so the stories that you provide to people. There's a lot of research that shows that um, people learn more easily through stories than they do through a list of facts. So if you can provide an example or a case study, um, it, it helps. Equally, if you can put in a little bit of humour, you know, it can also really assist in those scenarios. So... I think at this point what we're going to do is open ourselves up to the questions. Um, Emma, where are we at? So thank you both so much. Some absolute gems of advice and tips that I'm sure our audience will find useful going forward. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for you both. So a great question that's come through from Stephen is, I tend to shake when speaking, which affects my tone of voice and voice modulation. Do you have any tips for that? Practice <laughs> and persist. My greatest tip is we shake again because of that adrenaline running through our system. So um, utilising those breathing techniques beforehand uh, and, again, practising in front of people that you feel safe in front of um, will minimise that. The other thing that really helps me because... Um, um, on the odd occasion I too will shake if I'm particularly nervous, is a lectern. I hold on to the lectern. By holding on to the lectern, no one sees me shaking except me. <laughs> and it comes down to the more you do something, mm. the more it is you become with mm. that. So if you have to do a speech, see if you can work into this some smaller ones somewhere else first. Mm -hmm. With your family, with your friends, with your fellow students with other groups and to work up to this important one mm. so you've got a little bit more confidence because it's not the first time you've got up and done it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So holding on to something is a great thing to do um, and, you know, often if you're holding on to something, you shake a lot less as well. And in regards to it affecting your voice modulation, if you are very shaky, yes, it can make your voice sound quite shaky as well. The biggest thing is to focus on the words that you're saying, not the fact that you're shaking. Because if you're focusing on the fact that you're shaking, you're just going to make it worse because you're going to worry about worrying, about worrying about shaking. So realistically, focus on what you've got to get done, okay? And that's that perspective again. This is about getting my content out in an engaging way as calmly as possible. And it doesn't hurt in some situations to actually say, look, I'm really nervous, not all the time, but in certain situations, I'm really nervous, please bear with me, breathe, and then go into it. And mm. that just sets it up for them to, to, to know. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. What else have we got, Emma? <laughs> thank you for that question, by the way. Uh, thank you for answering. So the next question we have is from Kurt. He has had some feedback from one-on-one -on -one interviews where the people interviewing have indicated that the use of sporadic eye contact isn't enough. Um, and if it is only sporadic eye contact, it seems to be a sign of weakness. And he was wondering if you knew why that would be. Um, when we think about eye contact in interview particularly, uh, when people are nervous, they tend to stare at the ground or stare at the ceiling or anything else like that. And in an interview, 
it's usually a small environment, um, often with a panel of people. Um, my rule of thumb is usually each panel member will ask a question. Um, whoever has asked that question, I give them the most eye contact to answer that question. And um, I will often use my gestures towards that person. But I will also provide sporadic eye contact to the other people that are there. Um, when it comes to eye contact, particularly if, it's, if you're quite a shy person, in Australia, eye contact is a demonstration of directness, of honesty, and of respect, okay? If you don't use eye contact, people can think of you as underhanded or lacking in confidence or lacking in knowledge. If we were in a different country, the opposite can be said to be true. You know, there are a range of cultures that do not see things that way. But in this country, that tends to be the way that eye contact is perceived. So strong eye contact with people is not a bad thing. If I'm thinking about it, um, I don't tend to look at the person's eye itself. I will look at their face. I won't look at their eye itself. So by looking at their face, I get to kind of gather information about all of their expressions rather than kind of eyeballing them and doing the stalker thing. So, you know, simple fact, if I'm talking to Jeanette, I can talk to Jeanette and I can see her glasses and I can see that she's smiling slightly, but I'm not kind of staring. So sporadic eye contact is problematic because people that kind of look at you and then look away, it can, it can um, cause other people to kind of go, what's the deal? Is he that nervous? Et cetera, et cetera. Does, does that answer the question, Em, or do you have anything to add to that? Just a little bit of, with eye contact, it shows that you're serious because you're listening totally to that person. If you look away, they might think that you're distracted mm. slightly, even though it's more probably nerves, and they would understand that, that they want to be acknowledged mm. for their time that they have given you for the interview. The same as you be on the other end, have come in to give for them to give you that time by looking at you back. And that's the other thing with, it's not just eye contact, it's also head movement. So um, some nodding, Not don't be the nodding dog at the back of the car that does this the whole time, I'm not suggesting that. But um, you know, when they, when they say something that you agree with, you know, a little nod is really appropriate. You can also use your eyebrows quite a bit and get them moving too. And when you're looking at those people, again, remember, okay, I'm looking at you, five, four, three, two, one. Awesome. And I'm not suggesting that you do this, but you really can manage your eye contact um, so that there's more than less. Does that help, Em? Yeah, I think so. I think that answers it with uh, its very insightful answer. Um, we had one final question from an anonymous um, participant. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that worries me the most about doing presentations is the Q&A section at the end because I don't know what will be asked. Do you have any tips for approaching that with confidence? <laughs> yes, I do actually. Um, have somebody that knows what they're talking about next to you. That's always useful. <laughs> No, when you're thinking about the question section at the end of a conference, understand that there's one answer that you can always provide, okay? And it's okay to provide that answer. And that is, you know, I'd love to find that out. Let's work together and work on that, okay? So the reality is, is that usually in um, public speaking scenarios, people are not going to heckle you at the end of a conference. It would be tremendously unusual. Um, if they do ask a question, chances are you will know the answer because you're sharing and you're the expert in the situation. Um, but if you don't, it's a great opportunity for everyone to grow and to learn from you. Yeah. So when you're thinking about um, your questions in that kind of a space, um, what I tend to do is I look at my frequently asked questions all the time. Okay, even before I write a presentation, like for example, this presentation. I went through, okay, what are people's greatest fears? How does it all work? And then I mapped it back from there, okay? The other thing about this is, is that in any kind of public speak, that final kind of summary that you do should hopefully leave a couple of little holes that you can work on, yeah? So when I think about those couple of little holes, that's what I'd probably touch on. What, what do you think, Jenna? Be honest. 
Mm. If you know the answer, answer it. If you don't, say, look, I, um, I know it. Reasonable amount about this topic, however, I don't know everything. There are other people who I can refer to. Mm. So, meet me afterwards, I'll get your details and I'll find out and I'll get back to you. Absolutely. And you know, I noticed that in the in the webinar chat, we've got um, a question in regards to what's the difference between wandering and pacing? Okay, so for me, wandering has purpose. If I'm wandering around, I'm engaging different parts of the audience. I'm, I'm connecting my eye contact more closely with different parts of the audience. Whereas if I'm pacing, it's not, it has no relation to the speech. It's literally just wandering backwards and forwards because I'm nervous. So it's purpose is probably the biggest difference That's exactly for me. what I would say as well. Yeah? Yeah. Whenever you do gestures, it has to match your body language. So it's no good saying... That's a big fish. We need some <laughs> big fish. And the With same. my fishing, that's a big fish. <laughs> yes. But if you're pacing or whatever you do for gestures in general, make it purposeful. Don't do it just for the sake of pacing. Absolutely. It shows. Emma, do we have any other queries? Uh, just another couple from David that have just come through. Oh, thank you, David. I liked your last one. Yes. So he says, I feel that one person is harder to speak to than a group. Is that common? Yeah. You know, there's, there's people, you know, um, there was an episode of Modern Family on last night. Okay. Now, if you've ever seen Modern Family, uh, Gloria is a tremendously loud personality. She's, she's bright, she's vibrant, etc. She's a very good speaker. But she saw one of the people that she kind of um, looks up to on television in one of her soaps or whatever, and she couldn't speak. She turned into a, a big fat mess. There's always certain individuals that are, you will have trouble speaking to. And often um, it's the people that you either most respect uh, or, or look up to or are fearful of as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, the other thing is if talking one-on-one -on -one to somebody is worrying you, uh, have a look underneath and kind of go, what issue is it that's worrying you most in that scenario? Um, and how can you be honest and, and um, deal with that situation more easily? So, for example, um, I know that in relationships, you know, me saying to my other half, you haven't done the washing up recently, um, is very easy. But if I say, babe, um, I just wanted to let you know I just bought a pair of $300 shoes, it's got to be approached quite carefully um, for, for everybody involved. You know, I need to remember that he spent $400 on something else so that it's, it balances it, etc. So if it's a one-on-one -on -one scenario that you're more fearful of, consider why you're fearful of it. Is it just speaking or is it the topic actually underlying? Hmm, that's good advice. Um, so the final question, because we're running out of time, David wanted to know for this webinar, were you pacing your speech to the slide changes or vice versa? Uh, we were talking and as I felt that we'd covered the slide, I jumped to the next one. Slide, yeah, yes. I, I think that was, it was more a conversation style talking rather than anything that was pre-planned or anything like that. There's some really interesting types of, um, of presentations out there. There's a Japanese style of presentation where the presentation is saved and it's 20 images, okay? And every 20 seconds that image automatically changes. So you have to be prepped, oh, you've got to be fearful, okay? But it's called Pecha Pucha. So simple fact is it's fantastic for um, getting to the point because you've literally got 20 seconds. It's visual as well. So you know that, oh, I can't, but I move on. So if you're a waffler, getting it set up, oh, it's stunning. It, it, it's tough, but it's really good fun. I think I'd like to try that. Yeah, it's really cool. Have a look, look it up. It's fantastic. But, yes, for, for something like this, um, I just hit spacebar when I feel like we've covered the content. And in a webinar scenario, particularly when you've got a, a lovely guest speaker, um, you need to be quite adaptable to how much they talk to versus how much uh, content is necessary, etc. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you both so much for your time and for sharing all of your um, insight. Um, as Carolyn mentioned earlier, 
help seeking behavior leads to success. So we encourage you to put the strategies covered in today's session into action and to find out more by contacting USQ student services team, checking out the resources on Social Hub or the Toastmasters website.